greetings fanboys and fangirls and I want to wish everyone from my family the gangrene estates to yours Merry Christmas uh, well look at me it doesn't appear that I'm dressed proper for the occasion fanboys forever is really grasping its straws trying to include me in their Christmas reviews ain't they <laughs> but watch this hey, look at that right as rain well, that's not quite right, is it? Oh, that's much better. Well, welcome one and welcome all. It appears you've caught me on this fine night taking a little break. And remember, be careful out here on the estates. If you need anything at all, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, our first tale tonight features a review of a brand new action figure from Mexico. He's called, well, me. It's your boy, Theodore Soulcutter. <laughs> and I hope you enjoy. <laughs> I'll let you get right back at it. Ta-da for now. And don't worry, love. I think we'll be seeing each other soon enough. <laughs> Greetings, fanboys and fangirls. Jared here with another review from Fanboys Forever. Today, we're going to be having a look at the very first figure in a brand new series from Mezco. The new series is a horror-based series that they're going to start, I think, doing a whole lot of their more uh, macabre characters in, and it's called Gangrene Estates. The first figure in this brand new series is referred to as Theodore Sodcutter, and it is a Mezco exclusive from this new horror series of action figures. As you can see, there's some really striking comic book-esque art on the front, as this series is meant to replicate the old Tales from the Crypt comics and the many other hundreds of different titles that came out in the old pre-code days of horror comics that inspired a whole generation of horror movie and book creatives. Not only that, but we also have the Gangrene Estates logo on the top of the box. Along the side, you can see some of the little creatures that I did not get because they sold out too quickly on Mezco. Here's hoping they'll put some more of those in stock. And the groundskeeper himself, Theodore Sodcutter. On the back, they give us some more lovely art of the character. Opening the box, you can see that they have some more artwork of him, and it just kind of stretches out. But that's not all you receive. Not only do you get the usual little paper explaining that you need to be careful with your Mezco, but you also get a sheet of directions, which we will talk about throughout, including how to tie on different accessories, how to be careful with the arms, which has definitely been a point of contention with this figure, and also how to install the batteries. Lately, it seems like Mezco has amped up the amount of goodies that you get, and these are, of course, the free goodies that they throw in uh, each box. It appears that these are sorted by color variation. I got a red envelope this time, and inside I got one of these little stinkle pens right here. So that's pretty cool. I got a sticker, a couple of others, including Dog Nocturnal, which I'm always happy to get, and a very surprising new little Metzit. It is a horror-based, like Jason from Friday the 13th uh, variation, which I had not seen before. Uh, you can even take off the hockey mask, and he's got a skull for a head. So I'm very impressed with this. I'm very excited to see what other variations of this are out there. I think I have been seeing a few others online. He even has a tiny little miniature chainsaw that he's able to hold, so I think these are really cool. Perhaps the most significant of these little extras that you get is the Gangrene Estates comic book, which is made to look like those old pre-code comics that I was talking about. I have to say, I'm really, really impressed with this. This has definitely contained some of their best art that they've ever had in one of these comics. And that's saying something because their art is fantastic, usually in these. Um, I also really liked kind of the gag uh, ads and things in there. But especially I liked that they didn't go overboard with the content and things because that was definitely a little issue uh, that they had with their Doc Nocturnal comic. This, on the other hand, does a much better job of emulating that kind of source material from the time period that they're going for. And I thought it was a really good read, especially important if you want to know more about Theodore Sodcutter. I'm really excited about this new era of Mezco horror, and let's see how they kick things off with this inaugural figure. 
And here we have Theodore out of the packaging and on display. And you can see that he is all set up. I have both of his light up functions running and you can see pretty much all of the accessories that he includes. Of course, I've repurposed my Christmas display background to be a little more sinister. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Now, the first thing I'll do is talk a little bit about the sculpting and everything is so intricate here that there's quite a bit to talk about. So bear with me. First things first, we'll go ahead and look at the head sculpt. Indeed, as tempting as it is to have an entire review with that atmospheric lighting, uh, we really couldn't get a good look at the figure if I were to do that. So I'll try to come up with a good compromise and have the light a little more dim compared to what I usually do, just so that you can see the light up feature running a little bit better. Speaking of that light up feature, you can see that Theodore's eyes are glowing here. Uh, he definitely looks incredibly devious. This is more of the standard head, and I believe the one that he was packed with. And just to look at some of those ghoulish little details, everything just looks so cool and intricate. You can see that it's almost like a sort of simian zombie, if you will. And uh, there's just so much complexity to the figure. We'll get right into one of the first things you can change, which is the hat. Now, for each one of these head sculpts, I'll show it uh, with a hat and without a hat. Uh, there's so many different options that it's hard to cover everything, but I'll certainly do my best. Since this is a standard hat, we'll go ahead and look at all the hat options, and then for the others, I'll just throw a hat on there of choice. Here is the bowler hat that he comes with, which I actually like quite a bit. I think it's a great look. The cool thing about all of these hats is that they have kind of a little indention for the front brows that kind of plugs in just enough to where it's awfully secure as a matter of fact, can I? Yep, it won't even come off when you turn it upside down. At least not with the bowler hat, which I imagine is probably the tightest fitting one. So overall, I think this one is really successful on that standard head. And there's one more hat option, which is the top hat, except this time it's not squeezed down. It's just more like a standard uh, top hat or stove pipe hat, whatever you want to say. And I think it looks really cool this way as well. And just so that you can see a little comparison, here it is with the first one I had on there. It's just a little more smushed down. Depends on how gentlemanly you want this guy to look, I guess. This one is so fantastic. Now, under it, you can see that the light up mechanism is right there. This actually plugs into the neck peg. So you can actually, you have the ability if you want to, for some reason, you can unplug that and it has a little on and off switch and you install the little batteries that it does include. So that's a nice touch. I would be very careful with this if I were you. I also uh, definitely want to remind you that you really want to pull back on the neck as far as you can, because if you don't, Theodore has the habit of kind of looking downwards, which you probably don't want. With that, you just replace the head and you're on to your next option. So this particular head sculpt, he's looking pretty satisfied with himself which is probably a bad thing in gangrene estates. Probably nothing good has transpired. So there he is with a hat, and here he is without a hat. Here he is with a more stoic expression, with the teeth kind of out a little bit more, uh, looking very unhappy. This is probably uh, one of the more like zombie-esque of the heads, and I definitely get all sorts of uh, great horror comic vibes from this. Of course, Theodore is meant to simulate those old comics, so I think it works really well. For some reason, this one just says bowler hat to me, so we're just going to place the bowler hat on there. There you go. Looking real snazzy. Kind of a Solomon Grundy kind of looking head. Now, what I like here is that all the fine detail and everything is just doing so much heavy lifting, even like strands of hair. And these are some of the best head sculpts that Mezco has ever done. And of course, you know, you've got a winner of a company when in practically every review you're saying something along those lines. So this is very impressive. Now here's an interesting one. This one is more of like a rotting head. And just so you can see, yes, the eyeball is painted there with the pupil. Uh, really cool though, and I'm loving all the rot on the head. Yes, let's be a little cheeky here and put the huge Man About Town top hat on the zombie head. Look at that. Now here's where things start to get crazy. First of all, this is head number five, so uh, that's already saying quite a bit. This one is really horrific. It's like his face is starting to mutate and uh, the jaws are kind of unhinging and all these teeth are going everywhere. Kind of has a, a werewolf in London kind of 
horror look to it, a Rick Baker kind of feel. And uh, with the smaller top hat, it's uh, really cool as well. Almost like he's transforming into something a lot less tongue-in-cheek horror. So I think that's really cool looking and uh, actually really scary. And this is what I like to call the Max Shrek head. If you've ever seen Batman Returns, uh, spoiler alert for a 30 plus year old movie, uh, around the end of the movie, Max Shrek is fried to a pulp and he looks pretty similar to this. So let's uh, put him on screen here. Yeah, let's get a comparison, look at that. <laughs> so as funny as that comparison is, uh, beyond that, this is really extreme horror vibes. Um, this is as crazy, just about as crazy as you can go with a horror themed head sculpt. And, uh, you know, mad props to them for doing something like this. I think with the face being so elongated, my first instinct is to go with a shorter hat. So I think going with the uh, bowler hat is probably the best, just in terms of balance uh, for what you get. And I think that that looks really cool. If you want to be really extreme and create probably the longest head sculpt ever, you can add the really tall top hat with the long head and you've got something crazy looking. And because I did the other two, I might as well do the last one. Here is that shorter top hat, which might be a good compromise between the two. It's tempting to keep something this extreme and just such a testament to the great artistic ability of the sculptors just on it all the time. What is amazing is you can actually see the blood and kind of the veins and things in the backs of the eyes with a blue tongue. So uh, really weird and wild stuff. I am so impressed by all of these head sculpts. And as we go through the review, I'll just switch them for fun. I figured that we might as well get a good feel for all of them because they're kind of the main draw. The head sculpts are some of the only visible sculpt work on the figure. Uh, truth be told, the rest of it is pretty much covered by soft goods except for the hands. However, there are some awfully impressive soft goods at work here. There's so many different things and layers that it's hard to dissect it all, but we'll do our very best. For one thing, you have this very impressive coat here. Uh, it's definitely got this big collar, and then under it, there's this really nice green vest, and uh, there's an undershirt, which I don't plan on removing the coat because I don't really care about getting that look. So perhaps uh, someone else out there has pictures of him without the coat and without the scarf. But uh, to me, and this is just my advice for you, why mess with success? This is just so well-dressed and um, I, I don't see any way that it would benefit the figure to have these things off. Uh, maybe if you were looking for more extreme posing or something. Now, this is a good point that uh, if you put them to the side, the profile is so extreme. This is by far the most irregular human body that we've ever gotten from Mezco. And you can feel inside the sculpt. This isn't just, you know, like a, um, like a padding in there or something. The sculpt actually is doing this. The back is all messed up and everything. And I'm sure it's pretty gnarly what's under there. Another impressive element is not only do we have this wired collar up here, which I'll show you some options with that in a second, but the shoulder cape is so cool. Not only is it ornate looking, but there's all this like staining and things that's woven into the fabric. This is top notch production quality. And it's really a rare thing. You don't really see this level uh, very much with soft goods in the industry. But the truth is if anybody was gonna do it, I suppose it should be Mezco uh, who have definitely uh, been able to cement their place in the industry as a leader. Off to the other side, you can definitely see the scarf. And I'm very impressed just by the texture and the textiles used for the scarf here. Uh, you can see that it's got this real cool like woven effect, almost like it's this big knitted scarf. And I think that is so amazing for them to capture in a figure in the 1 12th scale. Something Mezco has been doing lately, which I actually think is a really good thing, is instead of using uh, real buttons, they've just been printing button like tamper graphs onto their vests and things. And I actually think that is the way to go. I think once you get into the other stuff, you're never gonna be able to make it look small enough to look right in the 12th scale. Heck, they can barely make it look right in the 6th scale. So I actually think this is by far your better way to go just for the visual. 
and then uh, this vest is just velcroed on right there now sometimes the vest can show that velcro and i've just like kind of undone it and redid it so that you can hide it a little bit better but it's not really a big deal now the pants themselves are awfully impressive because not only are they very well tailored but they also have these cool like mud and dirt stains dust stains whatever you want to say as if he's been out on the grounds working digging graves, getting into all sorts of bad stuff. So I actually think that is incredibly impressive. I also really like the uh, look of the shoes. They're really nice as well. Now the feet, and it's kind of hard to see unless you turn them to the side, are sort of unnaturally elongated and kind of arched upwards to make him look even more ghoulish. Definitely another feature of the soft goods is as I alluded to earlier, there is a wiring in the coat up here. So if you want him to be a little more mysterious, you can bring that up and it looks really nice. You can then use the wire to kind of do what you want with it and kind of sculpt a little. I'm not big on overdoing it with the wiring in this stuff, just because I know that sometimes it leads to disaster. Wiring is very sensitive. Mezco wiring tends to be kind of sensitive and stuff. So I don't feel as comfortable fooling around with this as I did with, say, Father Christmas from The Four Horsemen. Uh, the wiring is just a little thin for my taste, but, you know, you can use it to do all sorts of different posing, I guess, if you want to. And let's switch his head out. So just as a brief aside for this video, there's definitely been a lot online and in the Mezco groups made about these arms right here. As you can obviously tell, these arms are extremely long. For lack of a better comparison, they're ape-like, they're very simian, and it's definitely an artistic choice. Of course, Mezco is no stranger to this kind of thing, as they did this uh, similarly, to a lesser extent, with Nosferatu and those two figures. However, this time, lots and lots of people are reporting some breakage and that the arms don't feel very durable. So I'm sure that several of you all are probably wondering, watching this review, maybe even some people that own it, what my experience has been. Well, I will say that it has helped just knowing what the complaints were online. And so knowing that I needed to take the instructions really seriously about the uh, limits of the arms, that probably helped me and gave me an advantage. I will say that I definitely took my time kind of feeling the sculpt in here and making sure that I had it straight and not trying to pull it up at the wrong angle. Say for instance, right here, this is the front of the bottom part of this arm. So I know that I can very gently pull this up. But if I didn't know that this part was the front of the arm, if it had been rotated one way or another, and if I tried to pull that from another direction, people have shown online that the joint is extremely thin, like in this picture that I found on one of the groups. So it's not the kind of thing you wanna test. Uh, so just taking your time, being careful, it actually feels uh, pretty sturdy on mine, and also it actually even holds very well. I thought maybe it would be kind of loose or floppy, but no, not at all. Again, you can see that I'm just taking my time, making sure that I've found the actual top part of the arm and that I'm not bending from the wrong angle. I think that that is the biggest problem that people are having, is that they don't realize where the top of the arm is, and they're bending from another direction and snapping it. I will admit that it was a bad design choice. I'm not defending or endorsing that design decision at all. They should have made it a lot more durable. The truth is I already feel like I've had this experience before with Nosferatu. You can see that even though the arms aren't quite as freakishly long, they're pretty long. And uh, just knowing where the arms are at and where they connect at is very important to making sure that you don't snap these arms right off which I've seen several people do uh, in some of the groups. Do I wish they were more durable? Yes. Has it been a problem for me? No. And I certainly think that as long as you're really careful with it, uh, I don't think you'll have any issues. And don't be afraid to contact Mezco customer service. I know a lot of people have had lots of problems with that. Honestly, I've hardly ever had anything but a good experience. They really have helped me out. And um, even things that it took a long time to get sorted out, they sorted it out. Let's switch his head out. I definitely consider his rotting head to be the most accessory-ish of all of his heads because it is so out there compared to the others. Uh, so with that in mind, let's take this opportunity to look at some of the accessories. 
If we're looking at the scarf as an accessory, there is one kind of disappointment that should be noted. There's no wiring in the scarf. Now, I understand why not, of course, because when you have this intricate kind of a folding, you don't want a bunch of wire in there because it's just going to snap in a bunch of ways. It would also cause the scarf to be too thick, but having some level of posability or control on that scarf would have been really nice. So uh, that's just one little nitpick that I have. Another accessory that I want to talk about just right away, if I can, is this cool lantern. This is powered just like the head is by the included watch cell batteries. It does light up. It does have a little ring to hold it by. The battery compartment is down here. It's not very difficult to figure out. And uh, I think this looks really nice. I particularly like the cracked transparent plastic glass there. And it's just a very authentic looking kind of lantern of that era. So I really am pleased with it. I think it glows well enough, especially when it's a lot darker than this. Just to show you, I'll turn out the lights. And this is even with just uh, one of my studio lights off. You can see that it puts out a really decent glow and looks really nice. Before I forget, I definitely should mention the Gangrene Estates base that he includes. Chances are this is the base that we're going to see with probably all the Gangrene Estates figures as Mezco continues to build out this collection, whoever they may be. I really like this. It's a really nice design and I think it's going to go a long way in making this a very uniform looking collection. Also keep in mind that, you know, it comes with not only a foot peg, but a flight stand. I don't know why Theodore would be flying through the air, but hey, you know, knock yourself out. One of the um, crazier accessories that Theodore comes with is this decapitated zombie-esque head right here. There's just so much cool detail going on here with each individual uh, tooth painted. You can see the eyes. There's even a little bit of a suggestion of a pupil and things. There's a strand of hair, but if you move it just slightly, you can see the other pupil in there. So this is just one of those really gnarly and cool accessories. You can even see the flesh and the bone at the bottom. It's all green and rotted. You know, this is just a silly old school horror comic kind of fun. On the back, you can see that you even have green brains. So it's just, it's just goofy. You also have this thing right here which at first glance you might be a little confused by it, but this is actually really ingenious. You just plug it in and it's a strand of hair so that Theodore can actually hold this thing. Now, if you're curious exactly who this is or what this is, you'll have to read that comic to find out. And it's an interesting story. One of the other cool accessories that he comes with is this thing. This is like a tool bag or a medicine bag, if you will. And it has some of my favorite textural work that I've seen in forever. It's almost like a snake skin or heck even alligator skin, whatever you want to call it with clasps and a handle and even a little skull clasp right there at the top. Uh, but that's not all. You would think that that would just be the extent of it, but check this out. This actually unclasps right there. And then with these two clasps, all you have to do is pull and you watch and be amazed as this thing actually behaves as if it were a real bag with uh, storage inside. So if you wanted to, you definitely could take that head and you just pop it in. With that head safely in tow, you can then clasp it back and boom. Of course, he can carry this around and it's just such a cool looking accessory. I absolutely love this thing. You'll probably be seeing this pop up a lot in my background dioramas uh, when it's time to review a darker character from Mezco. So uh, kudos to them. This is truly amazing looking. Some of the other accessories he includes are tools like this shovel right here. Of course, I have it in the corresponding hand, which we'll get into in just a little while. But I love the damage that this shovel has sustained it's just barely together. It's wrapped up in places right here. It's the kind of thing that a lot of companies probably wouldn't give much of a thought to, but they really did go the extra mile to make sure that this thing was very impressive. And for those really tough jobs, uh, Theodore has this pickaxe right here. And again, just like the shovel, it has that same level of just absolute quality. You can see that metal and uh, the wood grain all throughout and it is just a sight to behold. Similarly, that can just be placed in his hand right there, and you can definitely get some really dynamic posing using that thing. By far one of the most interesting accessories that he comes with 
is his very own gravestone. Uh, this is featured in the comic. Uh, you can read the inscription on there and the really ornate design up there, really cool. And then on the back, they have just a little bit more. And so that's pretty interesting. There's so many different colors and things that have been dry brushed over this. It definitely has a little bit more weight to it than I thought it would. So I'm not 100% sure what it's made out of. It almost feels like cold cast a little bit. Yeah, it definitely doesn't feel exactly like regular plastic. Just be careful with this. You don't want to drop it uh, really harshly. Interestingly, it will stand right up as you can see it's doing back there. So that's something I always appreciate. Now he does come with a length of rope right here. And um, I hate to disappoint anyone, but I can't be the only person that looks at this and sees what they want you to do with it, but you're supposed to, you know, like tie this onto his back. <laughs> There's no real like specific direction for that. It's just like, hey, knock yourself out. Just, you know, loop it around a million times. How about this? I'll show you a picture from them of it tied around his back. Time for another head switch. I mean, God bless the people that do it, but I can't ever be that guy that goes through like each individual hand forever and ever. Uh, you have so many different options though. You have things like this hand where you can put something right between the fingers right there. You have just like open palms like this one, pointing hand, different clasping hands, and of course uh, fists if you want to use them. I mean, they're all really neat, but I think you get the idea. In total, including the hands that he has on, he has 14 different hands. So it's basically for anything you need. Nothing's been left out. And the oft unsung hero of Mezco accessories, the little Ziploc bag. I realize that a definite curiosity about this guy is going to be his level of articulation or lack thereof. So let's go ahead and just check that out. For one thing with the head, as I mentioned earlier, uh, he can look down a lot but looking up, he doesn't have a tremendous amount of range. And I think that a lot of that is due to like the hunchback. So you can pretty much get him to look straight ahead enough, but he's not going to be able to look up really. In terms of the shoulders, these are a little tricky. Keep in mind that he has a shirt on, a vest on, and a large coat on, which kind of has that thicker velvety texture. So you're going to be inhibited quite a bit. And keep in mind, that none of these things will really be a problem if you take some of this stuff off. Uh, but like I said, I have no desire to do that, especially with the arms being so sensitive. This is about what you can get comfortably in the coat going to the side. Definitely not 90 degrees. And uh, I have a feeling 90% of people that own this figure will not be taking the coat off. So I feel it's more important to show you what he can do with the coat on here. Now, you can of course bring it into the body completely. It hugs down completely tight to the waist like that. So you can see that you can get a really thin frame if you want to, which is a great option to have. Now, one place that I was surprised by the limit was uh, definitely the backwards and forwards of the shoulder joint. Um, going forward, this I really can't get it to do anything too much. Everything is so restricted by the shirt on the inside and the coat. As I've often said in these reviews, if you want to twist things around and maybe work them up, maybe you could. But the truth is, it feels harder to do here. I can maybe get about that much with the shoulder. You can see kind of the line there. But it's not much, so don't expect to have him with his arms way up. It's not really going to happen. This is definitely one of their figures that has the least functional arms uh, for a lot of reasons. Not only is it a thing at the shoulders, but also here at the bicep or the elbow, you can see that there, of course, is a rotation. So you're able to do this, and this isn't a problem at all. So you can bring them way out and bring them back in if you want to. Of course, as I said earlier, this is the place where a lot of people are concerned. Me personally, I like to grab both parts to give plenty of support, and then that way uh, the stress isn't on the joint. You can bring it down and get it about that straight, so you can pretty well get the arm completely straight if you want it to be. And in terms of range, I consider this to be a pretty decent 90 degrees, especially for joints that are so just out there and arms that are so long, they should have been a little more wise about how they design that joint because it's just going to cause them a lot of heartache and problems. And if they ever do a reissue or another version of this figure, it's something that I expect that they need to correct. 
And like I said, I'm not having any problems, but I wonder if eventually I will. Just be careful. Now down here, we can see that we do have a rotation and we do have hinges for every single hand. And there is an ab crunch. And that actually is a little more free than I thought it would be. There is a rotation, but this is about as much as you can rotate back and forth without it messing up the clothes. So as for the legs, uh, with the hips here, you know, Theodore can pretty well do sort of a version of the splits before it looks like it's starting to put some strain on the trousers there. So that's great for those wide stances, but you'll see in a minute why that's even limited a little. We do have a thigh rotation right there, and sometimes these can be a problem on Mezco's, but these actually feel really nice. So I'm really pleased with those. There is a double joint down here at the knee. So even though you, there's definitely not a double joint at the elbows, at least there is one at the knee that's very functional. And down here at the ankles, this is where we get into more limitations. Yes, there is a good rotation right here, so that works out well. It feels a little flimsy. Not as bad as some Mezcos that I've had, but yes, it does feel uh, slightly less reliable. But uh, some of the trouble happens because I think these aren't like hinges or anything. Uh, these are just ball joints down here, which goes back to kind of Mezco's earlier figures. There isn't really as much of a pivot to them. Now you can get a little bit of forward, a little bit of back, but there's really not a lot to it. Well, you would definitely hope that there would have been an ankle rocker pivot uh, that was a lot more effective than what you're getting here. Instead, I'll show you, he definitely can hold poses that are wide. And so he's definitely, even without the kind of extreme rocker ankle pivot that we expect from figures these days, he can still hold really wide poses without the display stand. So for as critical as I was, maybe they knew a little bit better than me because clearly he's not having any trouble with that. It only took me one try. And then with a straight up pose, once again, it only took me one try. Nothing is off balance. Uh, he's not falling over. I think with the lamp in his hand, it's just that extra little bit of weight that might pull him down a little, but I still think this is pretty decent. Honestly, uh, Theodore isn't really the type of figure that you're gonna have in all kinds of extreme like ninja battle poses. <laughs> that doesn't mean that that's an excuse though for the elbows to be the way that they are. I shouldn't have had to put a whole section in my review about giving you warnings about how to handle the elbows and they shouldn't have designed it in such a way that they needed a little warning that it comes in the actual figure package. So of course there's a ton of different comparisons that we can do from Mezco's Horror Legacy. One of those is, of course, one of the most recent figures, and that's John Constantine from DC Comics. These two look really great together. Uh, it is surprising just how tall, even so hunched over, that Theodore Sodcutter really is comparatively. He's a, a solid inch and a half or so taller. Of course, we can't forget about good old Mosquatch here, but it is funny because even though he's so much of a larger figure, he really is just about head to head with Theodore here. So it is funny to see just how large he is, but they really do look cool together. Using a smaller character like Doc Nocturnal here, and yeah, we'll put him in the red, it's Christmas. A uh, point really gets hit home about how big that this guy really is. One of the smallest characters is of course a cult private eye Atticus Doom, and he is really tiny compared to Theodore. Here we have the second version of Nosferatu, and he is a good bit smaller. So final thoughts on Theodore Sodcutter, the very first release from Mezco and their Gangrene Estates line. I think that overall it is very successful. You're looking at a figure here that is truly more of an art installation. Now, sometimes that's to its detriment with some of its functionality being a little limited by some of their artistic vision, like the huge gnarly arms. Uh, there are definitely ways that they could have designed that better and executed that better. But overall, uh, I'm left with a very functional figure that is very much also a piece of art. That's no excuse for some of its shortcomings. I definitely would have liked to have seen them have improved on some of their execution here and there. But overall, the effect is really hard to argue with. When you see something this um, mesmerizingly awful looking, it truly is horror art. 
and is one of the best homages I've ever seen to something like the Tales from the Crypt and the huge amount of pre-code horror comics that used to rule the shelves, even with some of the limitations to their artistic vision, I feel that this is mostly successful. And with the cool light up features and all of the neat things that they have in this figure, it truly is a sight to behold. And as long as you're willing to allow for a few concessions with being careful with the figure, definitely being gentle with some of those joints, then I think that you're really gonna have a great time with this figure. And I definitely suggest him. It's the kind of thing to where I have a feeling that they're just going to get more and more crazy with the releases in this Gangrene Estates line, and you definitely don't want to miss out on that inaugural release. All right, friends, if you enjoyed the review today at all, then please be sure to like the video and subscribe. It really does help the channel out, and it's just about the simplest, easiest thing you can do to help the channel grow. We really appreciate each and every view, especially those who have stuck it out to the very end. We always try to make it worth your while. And of course, if you are watching this around the holiday season, as funny as the uh, subject of today's review might be, then please have a Merry Christmas. I definitely wish blessings for you and your family and hope that you get everything you want this Christmas, especially health and happiness. And leave me a comment down below letting me know what you think of Theodore and let me know if you pick this guy up and if you had any of those issues with the arms. Of course, be sure to be careful with this guy if you get him for your own collection. And as always, God bless you and yours. And I'll see you on Fanboys Forever. Fanboy out. <laughs> Wasn't that just the most terrific review you ever did lie your eyes on? Anyway, it's date night for me and the missus. And Christmas and all. <laughs> we have a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> Till next time, remember, like, subscribe, and all that rubbish. Till then, we'll see you on the Gangreen Estates. The door so cut out. <laughs>